Great, thank you, and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm Caroline, and um, so I'm going to be talking about a project that I was involved in at the Metropolitan New York Library Council, um, Culture in Transit. So this was a project um, that ran from April 2015 to October 2016, um, and it was a partnership project between the Metropolitan New York Library Council, or Metro, um, as it's known, the Queen's Library and Brooklyn Public Library. So it was an externally funded project um, through the Knight Foundation, a philanthropic foundation um, in the United States. Um, and they run a challenge, uh, the Night News Challenge on Libraries. And they pose these questions um, and they ask people to um, apply with projects for how these questions might be answered. So the question that we were posed in, um, in our cycle of the challenge was, how might we leverage libraries as a platform to build more knowledgeable communities? So the communities um, that we responded to for our project, Culture in Transit, were the neighborhood communities of uh, New York City and also the library and archive community of New York City. And we united those two communities through the common strand um, in the project of mobile digitization. Um, so mobile digitization, <laughs> as you can see, just basically exists of us taking um, equipment that we can digitize collections to the people that need it. Um, so it was comprised of three kits. There were three digitization specialists. I worked in Manhattan. Two of my colleagues worked in Queens and Brooklyn. Uh, we had a flatbed scanner, a laptop, a mobile copy stand, which just um, comprised of a DSLR camera and an inverted tripod and lights. Um, and then when, in our community work, we added an outreach kit, which just basically existed of um, headphones and a tablet. So to put our project into context, um, and just to give you a bit of a flavor of the diversity that you'll find in New York City, here are some population stats from 2016. Um, and I think you can sort of reflect on the fact that New York is an incredibly diverse um, city, which makes for an incredibly amazing experience to live and work there. Um, but if you look at some of these statistics and then you think about um, the communities that make up these statistics, if you go looking for those communities in library and archive collections um, in institutions across the city, you just won't find them. Um, there's an incredible lack of diversity in representing uh, minority communities in library and archive collections. Um, and similarly, the work that I did with uh, libraries and archives in Manhattan, there's an incredible lack of diversity of um, libraries and archives being able to put their collections online. Um, there's incredible resource barriers um, to that. So if we think about digitization, uh, we can think of some of the barriers to digitization. So there's often not the people to digitize, uh, not the staff members there to do it. There's not the money to do it. There's not the time to do it, the equipment or the online platform um, to enable the digitized collections to go online. And so our project really sought to address that need um, in both communities. And so the work that I did with um, Metro. So Metro is a membership organisation um, that provides services to and advocates for museums, libraries and archives in um, New York City and Westchester County. So the strand of the project that I worked on was developing a mobile digitisation programme where we would take the digitisation services to those institutions who needed them hence me in the top left-hand corner with my <laughs> mobile digitization kit, go into an institution digitizing um, an archive or library collection for them, attaching the metadata, cataloging the collection, and then we would host the collection on Metro's digital uh, content platform. 
We would also give the institution a copy of all the images. Um, so we, um, we digitised to archival standards. We created master copies and then derivatives for online access. Um, and we gave them a copy of the metadata as well, just so they could reuse it um, however they wished. Um, and we also, as well as providing um, online content, online access um, on our digital platform, we also fed all of the content um, that we digitised through the projects um, onto the Digital Public Library of America, which is, is Europeana's cousin um, stateside. So, um, as you'll see, here are some stats. Over 12 months, I visited 10 institutions and digitised over 1,400 items um, and put them online. And here's just a small snapshot, just a teensy snapshot of some of the items that I digitised. Um, and I could spend a whole presentation um, actually just on the collections themselves because they were just so diverse and rich and wonderful. Um, but just to pull out one example, uh, we've, I guess over the last couple of days we've had a lot of anecdotal evidence and the value of anecdotes. Um, so I'll just... Um, tell the story behind these two posters on the right hand side here. So these come from Yeshiva University um, and it was a collection that I digitised of 177 hand-drawn um, and printed posters from the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry collection. So founded in 1964, SSSJ was a pioneer in the movement um, to oppose the persecution of Jews in the Soviet Union. And so you'll see here, these are the digitised images. If you just look back to this slide, on the top left-hand side here, this was the uh, condition that the posters were kept in. They were completely inaccessible to researchers um, because the university didn't have um, any way of displaying them. So they were just, in effect, hidden. Um, and so we had to get creative. Um, with how we digitised. Um, you know, we didn't have a digitisation lab. We developed our digitisation kit to be as effective as we could um, be, and so we got creative with some um, archival tape and book weights to sort of manage to get the posters flattened enough for digitisation. Um, but I just, uh, the real success story is that we managed to digitise them and put them online, and now they're being used um, not only in the... Um, states but elsewhere because um, they were put onto um, the Digital Public Library of America. And so you'll just see here the online asset access aspect of the project. So um, this is just Metro's um, digital content platform for hosting the collection and then DPLA pulled all the records um, from us and put them um, onto their um, online portal for international access and that was a really important part of our project to just have that international perspective um, to these sort of previously hidden collections. So that was the work that um, I predominantly did with institutions um, in Manhattan and so the other aspect of the project was community scanning. So I spoke earlier about the, uh, one of the communities we wanted to focus on was neighbourhood communities um, across New York City and the incredible diversity that you'll find um, in, those, um, in those boroughs. And so in Queens and in Brooklyn, there existed um, community engagement programs. In Queens, it, um, they operated under the banner Queens Memory. Um, and in Brooklyn, they operated under the banner Our Streets, Our Stories. So these were predominantly oral history programs um, where they would um, go out to residents and record their stories of living in the boroughs. Um, but we upscaled these projects to include community scanning. And you'll just see here, so this is Queens. This is, uh, these are all of the neighbourhoods that we visited um, over the course of the project where we held community scanning days in Queens. And then again in Brooklyn, um, this is where we held community scanning days. And what I mean by community scanning days is that we um, invited neighbourhood um, community members to bring in old family photos, um, old uniforms from high school or from um, their place of work, just memorabilia that connected their history to the community um, and that just told their story um, of living in their community. 
And so over the course of 10 months, we held um, over 50 community scanning days and uh, digitised over 2,000 items. And so this was really an outreach-centred model. So we, um, at the beginning of the project, we did an amazing amount of um, outreach, uh, produced flyers, got our name in local papers and local media, uh, just to try and entice people in. And um, it was interesting, um, looking back now, that after all our hard work, no one actually really turned up to the first few um, events and we were like, oh, okay. Um, but what we actually realised really early on in the, uh, in the project is community partnerships were key to working with neighbourhood communities. Um, community partners have, tr have the trust of their local communities and we were working um, in areas where community members can sometimes um, have a distrust of local official bodies such as public libraries where we were holding our events. There's a lot of undocumented communities um, in Queens and Brooklyn that just don't want anything to do with sort of any official public body. Um, and so we actually realised that by partnering with community groups who already have the trust of um, their community groups, they were able to um, basically screen us and say, you know, these guys, are, these guys are okay, you know, there's nothing suspicious. They just, they want to tell, help you tell your story. Um, and so we partner with some incredible groups um, over the 10 months that we ran the community um, groups. And we also realised pretty early on with the community events um, that people love interactive community events. So we originally thought that, you know, we would it would be enough for people to um, just bring their items in, we'd scan them for them. But we actually realised um, with the... Um, particularly the popular um, events, um, scanning actually takes quite a long time. And so we kind of wanted to bridge that gap and sort of engage them in their local history in other ways while we were actually scanning the uh, material. So we developed a lot of projects. We quickly added, as I said earlier, a tablet to the um, community kits. So we used the tablets in two ways. We preloaded oral histories onto one of the tablets um, so people could listen to other community members giving their sort of accounts of growing up in the neighbourhood. Um, and we also had one for a community history slideshow. So um, other photos of the neighbourhood um, that sort of would spark memories and conversation and um, that they could reminisce over. Um, and we also developed more, um, you'll see in the middle photo here, this poster with all the blue dots on is basically just a blueprint of the neighbourhood that we were in, that we were running the event in. Um, and we would just invite people to stick a blue sticker where they grew up, on the street that they grew up in. Um, and also just to leave a memory on a post-it note um, and stick it to the poster um, of growing up in and their experiences of living in um, that neighbourhood. And so we really use the community scanning events um, not only as a way to diversify the um, historical record of the city by sort of partnering and working with previously um, communities that just have no history online, um, to, as also as a space to um, sort of empower them to um, steward their own personal and local history and to really sort of communicate to them that their voices mattered. Um, we used to get a lot of people would be almost hesitant at coming to the events and almost um, question if we wanted their photos and um, it was a key message that we kind of had to keep saying that yes your voices matter like your history is just as important as anyone else's history um, because your history contributes to the wider history you know of the neighborhood and the city um, so that was really that was an important aspect that we hadn't quite grasped how important that would be at the outset um, and we also developed a brochure just to um so with community members, we gave, as with the institutions, we gave them um, their original items back, but we also gave them a flash drive for their own digital images. So just as a way to um, 
sort of help educate them on their own sort of personal digital archiving at home. Um, and we didn't just scan in libraries, uh, we scanned in a pub, in a cemetery, and we also developed quite um, a really great and engaging school scanning program. So basically the children um, were asked to bring, basically it was a show and tell, so they would bring in old family photos, they would discuss the photos, and then uh, we would be scanning them, um, and they would sort of like see the whole scanning process, and um, they were intrigued. Um, and so this is just, again, I could talk forever about some of the amazing content that we digitised at these community events, but here's just a sample. Um, and we've had some great, so the project ended over a year ago now. Um, all three aspects of the project in Queens, Manhattan and, New, uh, Queens, Manhattan and Brooklyn, they're still uh, going in some capacity. Um, and we've had great feedback um, from community partners, we, uh, there was recently an, an event in Queens where they ran um, a similar event to what we were doing during Culture in Transit, um, where, old, uh, where community members were invited back who had contributed the first time, and they were seeing their, um, the images that we digitised for them used to engage new audiences, and that kind of gave them a sense of pride that actually their, um, you know, their voices and their history mattered um, and was just as important. So that was the project in a nutshell. Um, we wanted at the outset for our project to be replicable. So this project was not unique to New York. Um, this project can, could be replicated in any community um, anywhere in the world. Um, and so we had the mobile digitization aspect that we wanted to be replicated, but we wanted people to be able to replicate the entire project. So we basically just put the entire project into a toolkit. Um, and we have community, we have a section on communities, we have a section on um, institutions, and we just basically, it's our entire workflows, it's how we develop the programs. Um, for instance, I think a lot of the time uh, people don't quite grasp um, sort of be able to quantify a digitization projects. So I kept detailed statistics over my time um, of how much I digitized and what I digitized. Um, we have downloadable resources for the community aspect, um, so copyright release forms, metadata forms, event planning checklists that are all there to be uh, downloaded and reused. Uh, we have equipment lists. Um, we have a master spreadsheet of every single item that we purchased for the project, um, and if it worked and if it didn't. Um, and then we put the whole toolkit on GitHub. So the toolkit is licensed under a Creative Commons public domain license, so anyone is able to reuse any of the content of the toolkit for their own use. Um, and they are also able to reuse um, the project site if they so wish for their own project, um, as we put it on GitHub um, for that purpose. And that was my whistle stop tour of culture in transit. So um, thanks so much for listening, and um, I'll hand over. Thank you.